Honorable Chief Minister Captain Amrinder Singh, Honorable Chief Minister Khattar Sahib, Bhadwaj Sahib representing the Honorable Chief Minister Himachal Pradesh, descendants of four martyrs whom you have just seen receive these small mementos, the grandson of Mr. Kalinath Ray, our editor, for 27 years, was imprisoned, suffered jail, paper was suspended, and he came back to edit the paper. Our distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, you have heard from the Honorable Chief Minister, Mr. Bhardwaj, fairly extensive thoughts on how this brutal massacre on this day, 100 years ago, affected the course of Indian history, changed the nature of the British-Indian relationship, the enormous cooperation and support that the Indians had given to the British at the time of the beginning of the First World War, and also kindled a new fire, that fire which was never extinguished and led to the liberation of our country in 47. And in between, as you just heard from distinguished speakers, we had the revolutionary group, these young people, who revolted against the continuation of the British administrative system in India and publicly vowed to overthrow it, a group of Bhagat Singh, Rajguru, Sukhdev, and the young Uddham Singh you just heard now, who waited till 1940 to travel to London and shoot former Governor Dyer at close quarters. That was the kind of inspirational revolutionary environment which was set into motion by the brutalities of this not so young colonel, the acting Brigadier General Dyer, who ordered his troops, as Captain Saab has told us in great detail, 1650 rounds to cause maximum killing and injuries. Not to say those who jumped into the well or those who got killed in the stampede. So the figure of 359 or 379 is in any case not a working figure. The number of people who died as the newspapers of that time and our own newspapers say are well over a thousand and several thousand were injured. I particularly have like to thank uh, Honorable Captain Amrinder Singh, Kata Saab, and Mr. Bhadwaj for having made it possible and convenient to be here with us today. Now, I, I don't need to at this stage say, why are we assembled here today? Why is it that the Tribune has taken the initiative, if I may say so, of getting this gathering together? And the reasons are manifold and the reasons are enormously serious and they are also enormously relevant to our present and to our future considering our past. This is a commemoration, I use the words, I wouldn't use the word celebration, of a centenary of what happened a hundred years ago in Jallianwalabad. That, as I mentioned just now, turned a new leaf in our history, and particularly the history of our struggle for self-determination, for independence and liberation from the foreign yoke. It also witnessed the emergence of Mahatma Gandhi, who took command of the situation when his meeting with the then Viceroy and in beseeching him as a lawyer, as a national leader, as a non-violent person, to withdraw the role attacks. And the Viceroy squarely refused to do so 
That is the time when Gandhiji decided it is the time to go into action. He was not a man of action till then. And he, and he announced the first, he announced the Satyagraha, which is literally meant the first All India strike, the first Pan India strike, which was totally successful. And it marked, I think, the first nail in the coffin of the British Empire. Because in those days, the communication system, the transport systems, it was not a small matter for, for a strike of this nature to be successful. All the shops and commercial establishments, traffic, other movements and activities, they came to a total halt. This is also an occasion, if I may say so, today's function, to revive and remind ourselves of the importance of the role of media, which at that point of time was essentially newspapers, the other forms of communication media had not emerged, had not developed, had not become established. The British had their own style of functioning. They combined enormous intelligence, they were astute and alongside brutal. They had set up their own civil and military gazette, which was published from Lahore which uh, came into being much after the Tribune. Tribune came into being thanks to the philanthropic wisdom of Dhyal Singh Majitia in 1881. Tribune was out and out a nationalist paper and carried out endlessly and fearlessly the battle of freedom. Among many other things, the, what the editor of the Tribune wrote by way of editorials and what he reported in the newspaper at that time, we didn't have a very large circulation, was to build public opinion, enlarge awareness, and strengthen the resolve of Indians in the entire northern region where the Tribune was read to, to carry out the battle for freedom. Among the newspapers at that point of time, I will make a passing reference. Besides the civil and military exit, which was out and out imperial and colonial, we had a very famous uh, journal, subsequently a newspaper, the Bombay Chronicle. It was edited by a British uh, gentleman, Horniman. He subsequently returned to England. He wrote about India after his return and he was uh, uh, as fearless as the Tribune, if I may say so. Now going back to the extensive narration that Captain Saab has given us about the, the military aspects, the enormous support, uh, I would just mention briefly that one of the reasons why the then Congress leaders also supported by the then Muslim League leaders, which didn't happen every day, and the general Indian belief to support the enormous world war effort to fight the war was based in the virtual conviction that the victory of the Allies would lead to the establishment of a new world order, which would lead to the colonies being decolonized, of self-determination taking place, freedom being gained. But this is not how it actually transpired. The British administration, particularly in the Punjab, led by this very ruthless governor, Dwyer, He was the number one governor at that time of all the provinces in India to collect the maximum loans which were extorted, to mobilize the largest 
collection of food grains to be exported again for the fighting the war. And perhaps what is most important, to mobilize the largest scale of recruitment to the British Indian Army. Uh, General Malik is here today with us. Uh, he would know more than me. And so would Captain Saad. The British enlisted more than 12 lakh troops and supporting elements to fight the first war, which is, uh, General Malik, if I'm not wrong, a number higher than the present strength of the Indian Army. And what is very important, Captain Saab, 60% of this entire number was from Punjab. And over a lakh of our troops got killed. When over a lakh of the troops who were enlisted got killed, naturally more than 60% of those killed were from Punjab. So Punjab had suffered economic distress for five years of the war, enormous coercion, difficulties, hardships, brutalities of the British regime, which all worked towards leading to what happened in Jallianwalabagh, which was no more than a very peaceful civilian protest by the local leaders and some outsiders to go to the deputy minister's residence and to ask for the release of Dr. Siafuddin Kitlu and Dr. Satyapal, both very eminent leaders, one Hindu, one Kashmiri Muslim. And that didn't happen. They were rebuffed. The next day, they took to looting government offices, public places, indulging in arson. And that led to further problems. And then both the younger dyer, the general, the colonel, and the senior dyer, the governor said, we'll teach them a lesson how to behave better in the future, in their own interest. We will teach them a lesson and kill them in their own interest so they know better conduct in future. The end of the war, the generally believe, would lead to Punjabis, people of Punjab being rewarded for their enormous contribution and dispensations are being granted to ease the pressure and the question. On the contrary, the security apparatus was tightened. The Defense of India Act, which was in force on the very beginning of the World War, was now succeeded by the Royal Attacks, which as one of the distinguished speakers said just now, no Dalil, no Vakil, no Appeal. You could be caught on the roadside, on mere suspicion, under the banner of public securing public safety, put to a kangaroo trial, and even ordered to be executed by the evening. And that is what happened after the Jallianwala Bhag. Martial law was imposed first in Amritsar, then all over Punjab. And people awarded life sentences, were executed in public. And for any alleged disrespect to the Imperial Majesty, the offenders were given public flogging. A platform was established in the heart of Amritsar, and people were flogged morning till night. I come back to the Tribune for a minute and uh, to take you back to the, 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 what has been published in this book, which has just been released in today's Tribune, in today's Punjabi Tribune. And in the past few days, in all our three papers, of extracts of archival material of the Tribune of 1918-1919-1920, and give you a very accurate picture of the role played by the Tribune, which has been serving the interests, exposing the interests of the people of undivided Punjab from the frontiers of, of Afghanistan to the borders of Agra, Ganga Nagar and Ladakh and Tibet on the other side. Tribune has served as the voice of the people, the unafraid, fearless voice of the people, which I claim and dare say, even till today, despite the change of circumstance, change of milieu, change of our cultural patterns, the Tribune continues to play that role. 
And just as the Britishers, just as the British masters got annoyed with the Tribune hundred years ago, on occasion Captain Saab gets annoyed, on occasion Khattar Saab gets annoyed. And we have to bear with that. We still survive. Sometimes they stop the advertisements, we still survive. But the point I'm making is that there is a political system, we have a democracy, there are various means of expressing our anger, our annoyance, our complaints. And the Tribune has continued to, with great credibility and honesty, serve the cause of the people of the present Punjab, the present Haryana and the present Himachal Pradesh. And Jammu and Kashmir and parts of Western UP and Delhi where we are led with great interest. And let me mention again that when Mr. Kalina Rev was arrested, jailed, imprisoned, his case went to the Privy Council. Mahatma Gandhi took up and argued his case. Interestingly, what the governor, the word used by Governor Dyer was that the Tribune is a local militant organization. Very deprecatingly, he didn't even say it's a regional or national militant organization. It says local, you know, very arrogantly. It says not worth the bother. So I, I will end by mentioning that the book which has been released today, which was again an effort and initiative of our editor, Rajesh Ramajan, and brings together a compilation of very worthwhile writings. And uh, he had asked me to write a foreword, which I did, my privilege. The point I'd like to make very briefly is that we need as a nation, as a people, in Punjabi foremost this evening, to remind ourselves of the sacrifices, the enormous, endless sacrifices, year upon year, decade upon decade, which have gone towards the achievement of our independence. The foundations of our nationhood are built on these sacrifices. It is therefore necessary that we take a fresh vow to safeguard our freedom, to safeguard the unity and integrity of our country, and particularly our younger generation must know more about what this is all about, Jalyavadabhag. In conclusion, I once again like to thank both the Chief Ministers, Mr. Bhardwaj, and the distinguished audience for having very kindly come and spend time with us this evening. Thank you.